in order to give us encouragement and inspiration for our practice, it is very important to have an example to emulate. And if we have a person we can look up to and, so to speak, in a copy or at least try to be similar to them, now that is a great advantage for making progress in our own practice. And I notice some people try to do that with the Buddha. They try to be a little bit like the Buddha, but that's actually not what the Buddha recommended. Using the Buddha as an example to emulate would be aiming too high. His Parami, as a person who was able to find the Dhamma independently, just relying on his own wisdom without having a teacher himself. Now, these paramis are so outrageous now, that he is in a different class of his own. It wouldn't make sense now, trying to emulate the Buddha in his the total perfection of all paramis. So, who else do we have to emulate? And the Buddha actually has given us examples for that. And he has given eight, two for each of the four main assemblies. Now, the four main assemblies is the Sangha of monks, or the Sangha of nuns, and the male and female uh, lay disciples. And we can already see, and it's very helpful that we have examples in each of these categories. It wouldn't make much sense not to ask Sandy that she should be like Venerable Ananda. Because Venerable Ananda is a man, a monk, he was ordained. She is practicing as a, a female lay disciple. So how, how could she be like Venerable Ananda? It wouldn't make much sense for me as a monk but to try to emulate Lady Visaka. It's just not, doesn't fit. No? You see the issue there. So this is why the Buddha has given an example, an idea, a top standard. A, a paragon, the epitome of the ideal disciple in all four categories. And of course, the very first condition that we actually can emulate these people is that we would have to know about them. <laughs> if you don't know them, it will be very difficult to emulate them. So what is the idea, the paragon, the top standard for a bhikkhu and even if you are not a bhikkhu yourself, and maybe you have a child or a grandchild, a little boy, what would you wish for them? Who would you wish them to be inspired by? What is the paragon, the top standard for monks? Arahant, yes, yeah. Arahant would be, no, but there were thousands and thousands of Arahants, and uh, not all will be equal in their quality. Some Arahants are even more outstanding than others. So this is now the question, what is really like the best, the top you can achieve as a male lay disciple who ordains and becomes a monk? What is a paragon of... You know, Perfection as a monk disciple. Hmm? Yeah, that was never as Xiao Lian said. Now, of course, now, the Buddha would use only an Avahant as an example. Now, someone who doesn't even have attained full Nibbana cannot possibly be you know, the paragon of a monk. But there were thousands of Avahants. 
So which of them is really the top standard? Yeah. Vanivasari Buddha and Venerable Mahamogalana. It is interesting that there's in each of these four categories, four assemblies, there's always a pair. And it seems you can't really say you know, that one is much better than the other, or the Venerable Sariputana would be considered as the number one disciple, you know, but it's basically a Savaka Yuga, you know, a pair of chief disciples. And it depends probably more on a, on a person's inclination and their character in which of these two possible directions they want to go. So there's Venerable Sariputta, Venerable Mahamokalana. And I don't talk much about that today because most of you know them. But how about the bhikkhunis? Same situation. There's two which are the paragon, the ideal. This is as good as you can get as a bhikkhuni. Yeah? Okay, Sister Kema, Sister Upalavana. Yeah, Venerable Damadina is also a Mahasavaka. That would be the next category. Now, there are some around 80 so called great disciples in all four assemblies. So you have a normal disciple who has taken refuge. Then you have a disciple who has also realized full Nibbana Avahanship. And then among those who have ever fully realized Avahanship as monks or nuns or stream entry as a layperson, you have got these great disciples who are even more outstanding. And then among the great disciples, you have two in each assembly, which are the absolute top. So Sister Dhamma Dinna would be the foremost, I think, in teaching Dhamma. And she's a great disciple. But she is not the absolute top. The absolute top is, as was correctly mentioned, Sister Kema and Sister Upalavana. And what were they foremost in? What was the quality which led the Buddha to declare Bhikkhuni Kema as the top disciple? And wisdom ne, in Panya. And Sister Upalavanna? Psychic powers. So this is quite similar to what you had in the monk Sangha. Venerable Sariputta first in wisdom. And Mahamokalana first in psychic powers, similar for the paragon, you know, the top idea for the nuns, Sister Kema in wisdom, and Sister Upalavanna in psychic powers. Now it's getting more interesting. How about male lay disciples? Anata Pindika, yeah, correct. Any other opinions? And again, he is a Mahasavaka, so he is already in this very elite category that uh, among those lay disciples, even among those who have realized stream entry, he is already higher category, he's special. But he's not the peak. As a male lay disciple, you could still do better than even another Pindika. Who is the one to emulate as the absolute paragon of a male lay disciple? It's also two. Chitta, exactly. And Hataka. Chitta. Osoda and uh, Hataka. But the one I really wanted to talk more about today is the category of the two top female lay disciples. And I'm often a little bit, almost a little bit shocked 
that particular all these incredible devoted female lay disciples of the Buddha nowadays often don't even know them. So who are the two top female lay disciples? Yeah, again, Lady Visaka is a Mahasavaka, so she was already distinguished even among those disciples who are at least stream entra. She was already distinguished. In which category? What was she so good in? Yeah, and Dayaka, generosity, like Anata Pindaka. But again, as a female lay disciple, you could potentially top even Lady Visaka. There's two which are... Kisa Gotami. No, she, w she wouldn't be his, his mother. That's a different Gotami. But no, she became a nun. And then she would be, again, a Mahasavaka, but in the category of nuns. We're talking now about lay practitioner who didn't ordain. Kochotara and come on there's now about ten ladies in here and many of you are such outstanding practitioners and you don't want to tell me that maybe a dozen ladies in here and you don't want to tell me that you wouldn't even know the top standard, the paragon of a female lady disciple. Kochotara is one Second is Nanda Mata. Nanda Mata. And what were their categories? What were they outstanding in? Kuchata, no, not wisdom. She could remember, yeah, Bahusutta, the learned, having studied the Dhamma, having remembered the Dhamma, having listened to Dhamma a lot. So similar to Venerable Ananda, and he was also one of his categories. Venerable Ananda was very special, he had, uh, I think, at least four categories where he was foremost. And one was uh, Bahusutta, having studied a lot, uh, remembering many suttas and understanding them. So she was uh, the foremost female lay disciple in that quality. And Nanda Mata. Jha Yinang, doing jhana, practicing samadhi, no, practicing and attaining jhana, which shows no, that uh, even in lay life, it obviously can be done. No, she's even the most outstanding, the foremost of those practicing jhana. Maybe a good occasion to talk more about uh, Kujutara, no, the paragon, the ideal, of a female lay disciple, because it also shows no, that you don't have to be a, a billionaire like Lady Visaka or Anata Pindika. No, some people may think, no, as a lay disciple, no, how can I keep up with no, these uh, bankers and banker daughters, banker wives who are billionaires? No, I cannot be a great disciple like them. No, you can even be better. And Kujotaba started her career. The Kudra is actually hunchback. So she had a hunchback. And she was a humble servant in the royal palace of King Odena of Kosambi. So she wasn't a billionaire, she wasn't a queen. And she wasn't looking like a supermodel, in fact, and she had a hunchback. So not, not the first an expectation you would have no, that she will be no, the absolute top female lay disciple. And in some days, or in some way even worse, no, she wasn't honest. She was actually embezzling money every day. Because uh, King Odena had a huge a kind of harem of wives in those days in India 
particularly the kings, they may have sometimes have you know, hundreds of wives. And this particular king had uh, three kind of main wives and another 500 secondary wives. Uh, one of the other main wives was Queen Samavati. By the way, she is also a Mahasavaka. So the wife of King Odena, the one of the three chief queens of Kosambi, Queen Samavati, was also a Mahasavaka. Do you know her category? What was she foremost in? Metta. He was the foremost female Metta practitioner. But she was kind of a, a beautiful bird in a golden cage. Because all these beautiful women, you know, they were not allowed you know, to ever leave the palace, basically, or only together with the king. So they were living a little bit like in a golden cage. But Nakujotava, as a hunchback, the king was obviously not interested in her. She was only a servant. But she had all the freedom. So she was sent every day to buy the flowers for the whole palace. And as it was a royal household, she got 10 gold coins. So can you imagine a lot of money every day buying flowers for 10 gold coins? And what she did, she bought flowers for five gold coins and then put them all out nicely. And five gold coins, the remaining amount, she just put into her own pocket. That's what you call embezzlement. It's basically stealing. And may also come under lying. So we can see she's not exactly a model of a disciple yet, because she hasn't even met the Buddha yet. And again, and it shows you know, that one doesn't have to be perfect to start off with, even to attain such a lofty position like the paragon of a lay disciple. However, one day she went out to buy her flowers as every day with her 10 gold coins. And on the way to the flower market, and she passed by the Gosita Rama, which had been offered to the Buddha as one of the main monasteries in Kosambi by the lay disciple in the Gosita. Gosita Rama is a big monastery there, and then like Jetavana in Savati or Veluvana in Rajagaha. Kosambi, which was located on the Yamuna River at the Gositarama. And somehow she noticed now, that there's this big crowd and some famous spiritual teacher seems to be teaching. So she had this intuition, um, why shouldn't I go and maybe listen as well? Maybe it's something interesting. So she went in and she listened to the Buddha and it really hit her. And right there, by listening, she became a stream enterer. She understood the Four Noble Truths. She had you know, the eye of Dhamma, the Dhamma Chaku, Dhamma Chaka no, arising, Dhamma Chaku, Dhamma Chaku arising, the eye of Dhamma, and whatever is of a nature to a wise that is also of a nature to cease, to end, and the basic understanding of conditionality and impermanence. And then she left the monastery flying high in a stream and is obviously in a very happy, there's tremendous inspiration in the Dhamma, wholesome rapture and bliss. And now she went to the flower market now a stream enter, a sotapanna, in the first stage of enlightenment, already for sure that within the maximum of seven lifetimes she will be in Avahant, the latest, secure for Nibbana. What did she do now? Yes, why? why? <laughs> and why? She obviously she wouldn't steal anymore, she wouldn't embezzle, she wouldn't lie. It's no no doesn't Sotapanna wouldn't do that. So she bought now flowers for ten gold coins. 
and she put them all out. Now there's twice as many flowers. So all the queens are surprised. Now where do all these flowers come from? And then the queen Samavati in the court say in and, and uh, asks her, what, what is the reason? Why do we have so many flowers today? What would she answer? And she would confess. Uh, that the nature of a stream and one, even if they ever do commit an offense, it doesn't seem to be utterly impossible. And this maybe if they're really disturbed in their mindfulness or in the extreme situations, maybe they can have small infringements. And in her case, it was anyhow before she became a stream enter. But it is stated in the Vatana Sutta, it's impossible for a stream enter not to confess it. If they do commit an offense, then it's absolutely certain they will immediately confess and do whatever is required to purify them. So she confessed straight away you know, that she had possibly for years and you know, stolen all that money. But this is quite serious. This is ancient India. It's not like here, you know, um, three months community service and one year probation. And that may be you know, getting tortured to death and things like that. Death penalty happens very quickly for stealing even one gold coin. So it was quite a big thing you know, to confess that and to be so honest. She was basically you know, playing with her life. And uh, the execution would often be in a form of torture. But the you know, stream enter would you know, rather go for that you know, than lying. But of course she was very lucky because the person she confessed to later became the foremost female lay disciple in practicing metta. <laughs> So she wasn't insisting on it to have her punished. And although she was the foremost in Metta, Queen Samavati, she obviously also had wisdom. You know, the wisdom faculty you know, to become a Mahasavaka, you know, they have all of the faculties you know, to some extent, to quite some extent. So Queen Samavati was thinking that when she heard the whole story, this is quite an amazing teaching. She listened only once and then immediately she confesses and is stealing this whole treasure of gold coins and taking the risk that she may get executed. I wonder what kind of teacher is that? What kind of teaching? So the queen became very interested. And then they asked her, please tell us what the Buddha was teaching you there. We want to get that teaching as well. But uh, Kojotaba now as a stream enter, one characteristic of a stream enter is now that they have the highest respect for the Dhamma. Now they have Avechap Pasada, this unwavering, total, joyful dedication, faith, conviction, confidence in the Dhamma. And so they will respect it higher than anything else. So she told the queen and the other queens, no, if, if you want that, I will have to sit on the high seat and you have to sit on the floor. Again, in our society that may not sound so, no, so uh, special, but in ancient Indian society, which is so hierarchical and caste, and she's just a servant, hunchback servant. This is a chief queen. <coughs> and the idea you know, that the chief's queen would sit down on the floor and the hunchback servant on the, um, the high seat in ancient India would be you know, very, uh, quite outrageous, basically. But you know, the queen, being keen to get the teaching, being already impressed with what had happened so far, and they were happy to agree on that. And they bathed her and perfumed her, and then she was sitting on the high seat and teaching the Dhamma. When they heard the first teaching, they got very keen on getting more. And then they had an arrangement, and 
Kutsutava, the being free to leave the palace if she wishes. No, she went out no, every day, going to the Gositavama and listening to the Buddha. And then she went back to the palace, sitting on the high seat and teaching no, all the queens. And of course, no, the Buddha with his psychic powers, no, he would be quite aware of what is happening. And he would probably, you know, the psychic powers, even check out you know, how the other queens are doing and whether they are getting it or what is the uh, areas they don't understand yet or which qualities in some of the queens you know, need further instruction and guidance. And then went quite a long time. Every day the Buddha teaching, she listening and repeating it in the palace. And it continued till all of these 500 women except for Magandia, the evil chief queen, but all the others were at least three mentors themselves. And uh, Queen Samavati became an anagami, third stage of enlightenment, and the foremost female lay disciple in practicing metta, loving kindness. And this is why she is a category of those who have learned much and know a lot of Dhamma, because you know, she did that all by heart, listening to the Buddha, then immediately remembering it, and then reciting it by heart back in the palace. Now, would you be curious what kind of teachings that was? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could know what, what teaching she got? Or what do you think? Would you find it interesting? Hmm? You can read it all. It's all there. We have it. Where is it? Hmm? Yeah, four noble truths is a category, you know, but we have that teaching literally, word by word, syllable by syllable, the whole collection. Every day what she listened and then taught to these queens that they all became at least dream and were. We have it all, literally. But where? In the Tipitaka, and how is it called? It's called Itivuttaka. It's one of the books in the Kodaka Nikaya, like the Dhammapada, like the Sotanipata. It's one of the the minor collections in the, in the fifth Nikaya. So I highly recommend that to study that. It's fascinating. And you also have good English translations. There's one from the Buddhist Publication Society, a booklet. And then there's Nabiko Bodhi who has got it and sorry, um, Ajahn Taniso has got a free version on his website which you can download the whole thing in English. And you can imagine what kind of outstanding disciple you know, that what was collected you know, by a female lay disciple has been uh, transmitted for 2,500 years and we still have that as one of the books of the Tipitaka. And it's fascinating when you look, you may notice most of the suttas, they start evang me sutang. Do you know that when suttang, evang me sutang, what does it mean? Thus if I heard, ne? and who is saying that? It's Venerable Ananda. Of course, Venerable Ananda has a clear memory. It's not just some, something abstract. Evang me sutang, ekang samayang bhagava savatiyang viharati. So Venerable Ananda remembers a concrete situation. It's not some diffuse memory. He remembers it was uh, this time of the year, it was in Savati, these people were present. Just like in a contract, even nowadays, and if it's something important, you sign in and you give the, the, the place as well. 
important contract and is signed in a certain place, and that gives it more authenticity. So it usually starts with Evang Me Sutang. If you go into the Itivotaka, it goes Evang Hetang Vuttam Bhagavata Vuttam Aratati Me Sutang. So it's a different formula. And this is why it's called Itivotaka. Vuttang Aratati Me Sutang. And you can see in the, even her individual style, which is different from Venerable Ananda, they are still being preserved in that scripture. And she doesn't really say, uh, Ekang Samayang, uh, at one time the Blessed One was living in the Gosita Vama, because that was implied, and it was all in the Gosita Vama. And the other queens, and they would know exactly where she would go, and there's this one monastery, and it all happened in the same place. This is why she didn't have to give an explanation. At one time, the Blessed One was living in the Gosita Rama, and they all knew that every single event was in that place. So isn't it amazing? Someone who started just as a humble servant, as a disabled person with a hunchback, and uh, as someone who was stealing, embezzling the gold coins by a really substantial amount. One gold coin in ancient India was a lot of money, and she did five gold coins a day. And then ending up as a paragon of a female lay disciple, and having the teaching she got from the Buddha, the remembered and transmitted even up to our time. So have you all read the Devotaka? Hmm? Good, good. That is also interestingly a teaching which was in particular aimed at women. Because the Buddha was obviously you know, with his psychic powers, he was fully aware of what's going on. And there was particular design for this large group of exclusively women. And we can also notice that Kujutava wouldn't have had a kind of Brahman training and recitation. So the suttas are relatively short. And I think that was to accommodate her Venerable Ananda had this in a very exceptional, almost photographic memory in terms of audio, audiographic memory. But you can't expect that from everyone. And probably her education was limited anyhow, so she wasn't used to be able to remember a two-hour recitation on one go. So one can see in this relatively short suttas. And uh, they all have uh, verses usually one verse or a couple. It is also interesting that maybe these queens or Kujutra herself had a particular liking of poetry. So I can highly recommend to study that. And it's easily accessible. It's not meant that you read the whole thing in one go. This is a really good one. You can just, if you wish, you can just open one page and see what you get there. Or you can go from beginning to end one little sota a day and then reflecting on it and taking it into your meditation. This is often better than reading a lot. Taking one little sota and you get it both. And you get first the thing in prose it is normal prose is usually in a more precise. And then the Buddha expresses you know, the idea once again in verse. And the verse is not so precise linguistically, you know, but it is you know, much more inspiring on the you know, emotional level, on the inspirational level. You can get something across other than just you know, intellectual thoughts. And you get both together, and then one can reflect on it, and one can also just quietly meditate on it. So you read the sutta, and you maybe like to recite it, 
And if you look at the verse, you can look at different translations, contemplate it, and then you just sit quietly, silently. And you will notice that if you put something in before your quiet meditation, on a deep level, the mind may continue in the working with that. And once you come out of your more samadhi meditation and turn back towards investigation, and you look at the sutta again, or the verse again, then the meaning becomes the more apparent. <laughs>